Yeah, just a bye-bye, my little girl. Bye-bye. She doesn't like me at the minute. She's going through that stage where she doesn't like Daddy very much. I think it's because I have to tell her off so much. But, so I'm going to do a, I think, one weeker on this topic of mistaken identity. Mistaken identity. And I thought I'd start off with a little story um, because it's happened to me quite a lot. I've got one of them faces. I've got one of them faces that either people think I'm somebody else. It happened, honestly, it happens a lot. Like, they're like, oh, you know, my friend from... I'm like, I don't know who that is. And why are you telling me that? But I've got one of them faces where people mistake me for something. Or I've got one of them faces that people want to punch. <laughs> it's one of the two. And this particular story is a combination of, of the both. And I was out in... Um, Back in my heyday, uh, BC before Christ, I grew up in a, in a non-Christian home and um, I used to go clubbing with my friends and cousins and I used to go, in Bury St. Edmunds, there used to be a club called Brasilias. Yes. Don't, don't, don't cheer that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the wrong bit. Um, but it was, I used to call it the Bat Cave. It was not, a, it was, yeah. And so I think people could see us from Thetford as well, so always wanted to, to fight me. But, um, and I was quite a big bloke, roughly quite tough. But my friend who was with me, his name, I won't tell you, Simon, was, he was by the bar and he had ordered a drink. And this big fella, he was, I don't know, must have been 6'2", 6'3", looked like a rugby player and sort of fella. And he, he took this, guy's pint accidentally, or his drink, I can't remember what he was drinking, and he sipped from it, and this, this, oh, such a lovely bloke, this Simon went, excuse me mate, you've just picked up my pint, and this bloke just looked at him, and just took a big gulp of it, and then poured it on the floor, and put it back down, and turned his back, and any of you guys who know me, <laughs> I was just a couple of metres away, and I was like, oi, <laughs> walked up behind him, poked him on his shoulder, which was a bit high, <laughs> oi, <are> you, <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? Like, and I was, <laughs> I, was, I was not quite as gentle as I am these days. I said to him, you are going to buy my friend another drink. I was like, do it now. And I was really angry. Like, because at that stage of my life, I was a big drinker. And I was like, you do not waste alcohol. Nothing to do with my friend. <laughs> like, at that stage of my life, that's what I was like. But, and it was funny because all of a sudden, there were seven or eight other guys that appeared around this fella that I hadn't clocked, who were all together. And it was just me and my friend. All my half mates were somewhere else. And I was all of a sudden, because one on one, I'm like, I'll take anyone on. That's the sort of spirit I'm, I still have, if I'm honest. And, and I was like, there's seven or eight of you. I'm in a bit of trouble now. And so, and then this guy, one of them said to me, I know you from somewhere. And I've told this story before. He'll know it on the front row here. But some of you haven't heard this before, so I'm going to tell it again. And if you're here for any length of time, in a couple of weeks, I'll probably tell it again. But this guy went, I know you from somewhere. And I was like, oh, no, now they're going to know I'm from Thetford. Now I'm really going to get beaten up. But I glanced down, and he had an Ipswich football club shirt on. And I was like, ha-ha. And my brain worked really quickly. It used to back then. Because I used to get mistaken from a, the Norwich goalkeeper who moved to Ipswich goalkeeper. I think he went back again, didn't he? Mr. Andy Marshall, I think it was. So at that point, when I was much younger looking, less fat, I looked like this guy, Andy Marshall, who was a goalkeeper. And so my brain went, ah, you probably think I look like Andy Marshall, who's the Ipswich keeper. And he went, yeah. And I went, and I shouldn't have done this. It was a lie. I went, that's my brother. And he was like, oh, really? And they were all Ipswich reporters. And I was like, phew. And he's like, let me get you a drink. And they bought me a drink. I forgot all about my mate. <laughs> I was like, phew. And so sometimes mistaken identity with a little tweaking can work out good in your favor. But I remember sometime it didn't when I was desperately embarrassed when... And not I was mistaken, I mistook somebody else. It's when I was in the library at a university and there was lines of computers, and I was at my computer doing my dissertation or something, I can't remember what I was doing, back in the day when the internet was so slow, and, and Steph was behind me on the next row, so you had to walk round the row and to get around to go and see it, and she said, Phil, I, can't, I don't know what I'm doing, help me with this, and I walked round to the back, I put my arms around her on the mouse and started looking at her, screen, like, what are you even talking about? And then she went, Phil, and I went, <laughs> and she was the girl, <laughs> next... And I had my arms, big, burly rugby player, around, sweaty probably as well, usually I am, around this girl who didn't say a word. She just... 
She just froze. And I was like, I'm so sorry. And I just went back to my chair. I was so embarrassed. It was because I don't like touching people who I don't know. Like, it's like, get away from me. And so that was so embarrassing. But that was a bit of a bad outcome for me with mistaken ident identity, which I think is more common. When there's mistaken identity happens, I think there's more, it's usually bad that comes from it. And like, if you think of it, especially in a criminal case, like in, in, a, in a case in, in law, if there's or a big crime that's happening, if there's a mistaken identity, the, the, the outfall from that could be tragic. But why am I talking about this today? And the reason is, and I've, I've been thinking about this for some years now, and I'm not sure how deep I'll go into this, maybe just this week, maybe for the next few months. <laughs> but our culture, I believe, is, is in identity crisis. I think so much of our culture in the West, let's say, is in, in, identity, in, in an identity crisis. And from, from a national point of view, from cultures, from subcultures, all the way down to individuals, where there seems to be this identity crisis that's going through all them tiers, all them layers, all them stratas, where there seems to be this identity thing of not knowing quite who you are or who they are or who we are. And so I wanted to talk about it. And I think this problem's been magnified and and accelerated through new technology, I reckon, where, especially with social media, where you can basically present yourself, we can present ourselves as anything to the world and are bombarded, essentially, with everything from the world. We can present how we like to the world and we're bombarded with everything from the world. And it leaves many asking, maybe you've asked this of yourself, but it's leaving many people asking, even if you never articulate and say the words, but asking, who am I? Who am I? And when I think about it, and I, I've been studying this, our identity is complex. It's a complex mosaic of things. And if you don't know what a mosaic is, like a picture made up of little tiny tiles. Some of you might do it in your bathroom or something. You know, I, I did it, was it the Greeks or the Romans? I can't remember. Used to have mosaics everywhere. All their artworks was a pictures made up of tiny little pictures, which when I think about it is actually what pictures are. <laughs> They're just pixels. So... But I believe our, our identity is like a mosaic of things, mosaic, lots of tiny little elements that come together that, that create this image, if you like. It's, for me, not a simple, single characteristic that makes you, you, or me, me. And if we view it like that, if you view yourself like that, or you view someone else like that, where one or two big characteristics of you are sort of what make up your identity, I think it often leads to a case of mistaken identity in what you think about others, what you think about yourself, and what others think about you. When you base your identity on these one or two or three big characteristics of you, I think it leads to mistaken identity, which feeds into this identity crisis that we're seeing. And so I'll ask you the question instead. Who are you? <laughs> That's the sort of thing I used to say to people. Who are you? You know, when they're getting aggressive. Who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? No one knew who I was. Who are you? I want to ask you, who are you? And I mean, I mean specifically, who are you? Because some of us never asked ourselves that question. You're like, well, I'm, I'm Dave. That's not, not, not you, Dave, but just the general <laughs> name. Everyone's not Dave, clearly. We've got a few Daves in the room. In fact, we have got a, a, an unusual amount of Daves in the room. That's weird. So, who are you? And I mean specifically, and, and to ask ourselves the question, are we mistaken about our ID, perhaps, sometimes? Are we mistaken about our identity? Uh, do we have a case of mistaken identity? Because we can, we can root our identity, identity in so many things. So many things. That's why it's such a mosaic. It can be our culture. It could be your subculture within a culture. It could be your class. I know some people who have who are, everything about their identity is based and rooted and founded in their class. You know, I used to take the mickey out of Jack all the time because he's like, I'm working class, and I'm like, we call him middle class because it annoys him. <laughs> Which is weird because you think social mobility is a good thing, but he's like, no, I'm down the bottom. I'm not. <laughs> Probably because he used to look at people at the top and think, I don't like you for whatever reason. But some people who are higher up would never want to be viewed or identified as working class or below it. It'd be like, it would wound them that th people would view them in that way. So often we're... We have our identity tied up and entwined in our family name. If you've got a particular family name and they're rich or famous or it's in a town where you're tough or you're in business or whatever, that family name can be part and big part of your identity. 
It can be tied up in your job or your career. For other people, that doesn't even enter their identity. But for others, it's a big part of that mosaic. It could be your career or even your position in work that you base so much of your identity on, especially if you're an authority in any regard. It could be your socioeconomic status feeds into that. It could be even your relational situation. You know, if you're married, maybe that plays a big part of your identity. Or if you're single, or if you're a parent, if you're a mum or a dad or a grandparent, it feeds into this idea of your identity. It could be hobbies, interests, skills, all these things that we layer in. It could be your looks, if you're good looking, or if you're really not good looking, maybe you play on that. And that's part of your ID. I remember a guy used to call himself the ugly bloke. Like, and it was part of his ID, and I think it was more a protective sort of thing, but it became what he was known for. It was weird. A Quasimodo, you know, that's how we know him. It's half formed. That's his identity. It could be that you've got big personality traits that, that overpower. Perhaps it's your morals. It's the things that you do and think are good and right. They're the things that bring you identity. Or perhaps even your signaling of their morals. If you're a moral virtue signaling person, you don't do any of the things. You just post about them on Facebook so people think you believe or these things. But that can be all part of our identity, what we're throwing out to the world. It could be about music. Some people are so entwined with the music that they listen to and it becomes part of their identity. It could be fashion. Clearly not me. It could be the food you eat. Whether you're carnivore, whether you're vegan, it could be all everything in between, the types of food you eat. It could be your politics, it could be your church life, all these things. And then on top of that, some of the bigger character characteristics. Some people attach value in their identity through characteristics like gender, sex, race, nationality, disability, sexual orientation, all them things. And I do not want to go down that rabbit hole because... <laughs> I'll get emails and stuff, and probably banned from YouTube as well. I don't, I don't really want to go into that, and maybe I will in the next few weeks. Maybe I'll be drawn into it. But what I want to say about any of them things, and there's nothing wrong with them things, but placing weight or value on us or on other people in, in one particular aspect that make up who we are can lead us and others to experience a classic case of mistaken identity. I think we can when we give certain things like that big weight in our, our identity or other people's identity. It can lead to a, a case of mistaken identity where we're not actually who we think we are or people don't, don't actually realise who we are. And I thought about this for me, and I will get into some scripture at the, in, in some point, don't worry. Is that I was thinking for me, like at 17, <laughs> it's a good job me and Matt didn't meet at 17 so wildly different in our identities but and he's a good mate now but back then I was at 17 I, I had long hair <laughs> I was expecting a bit of a laugh then actually because <laughs> it looked really bad it looked like a mushroom that's what I looked like it was because it's curly my hair so it's big and it and the more humid it was like today it just grew bigger and bigger like the scene out of friends with Monica uh, that that my hair was huge but it was really long I was growing it long because why because I was in a band I was, I was in a band and considered to some degree, and I wasn't really, but a muso. And so that's got its own little subculture. And, and it's funny because we've got a few Americans in the room. When we watch your media and your high school stuff, you have these pockets of people, these groups of people. And like, we don't really have the same in the UK to the same extent, but it still happens. Because at the same time, I was like a muso, like not goth or anything like that, but just, you know, grungy looking looked a bit weird, had different sort of makeup. My brother went extreme, had black nail varnish. He was like punk, had a piercing through his nose, all that sort of stuff. I, I didn't go that far. I said, like, I'm not sure I'll go down that, that route. But at the same time, I was a rugby player. I was a rugby player and I had a friendship group that were rugby players and would, others would have considered me like the sportsy guy or Americans, you call him a jock or something. Is that the right term? Where you're like, the, you're the sport, that's your identity. And for me, I wasn't either of them things particularly, but at the same time, I was really academic at school. So other people would call me geek. I'm like, geek, that doesn't fit me. I'm like, I'm, you, mean, you mean I listen to the teacher and do my work? Is that what you mean? Is that what geek is? And now geek's cool. Where when I was at school, geek wasn't cool. They tried to beat you up if I was a geek, but they couldn't. So I was academic and, and I was driven. Yet at the same time, I was, let's face it, I was a drunk. At 17, I'd wait for the pubs to open. I'd come out of college, I'd tell my lecturer I've got to go for some reason. At 11 a.m., I'd be in the pub drinking with my friends. And I'd go back, I remember going to, it's not funny, 
But I remember going back to a biology class, doing experiments with dangerous chemicals, and then made this big to-do about how to be safe. And there was me barely being able to stand. And so there was this, I was this like good boy, very academic driven, who was a drunk at the same time, jock, muso fella. This idea, it sounds very mixed up. <laughs> but I was a good boy, and I had a, I had a strong moral code. Not in everything, people would have disagreed, but I had a strong moral code. You don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't thieve. All these things, strong moral code, moral, 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 moral. But an evangelical atheist who didn't believe in morality as such. And it was some abstract concept that was, that was a subjective and man-made. And yet, very, <laughs> these things don't go together. But this was who I was, and yet I was a nice guy. I really was. I was friendly. Friendly guy, really friendly, cared about what people felt, and I, want, I wouldn't want anyone to be uncomfortable at the same time having such a sharp, sarcastic tongue that I could decimate anyone. And I'm all these things all at once at 17. I'm a mosaic of a person. And yet, if I take any one of them characteristics and lifted it up and gave it weight, that is what would be my identity. But that isn't what my identity was. It was all of them things. And that's the danger when we lift one particular part up of us and demonstrate and show it to people or give it away even in our own mind. We even in ourselves have a case of mistaken identity of who we really are. Because <laughs> now I'm not any of them things, really. Not even nice guy. <laughs> you know, now I'm known as the guy who wears shorts. That's it. Honestly. Like, and it's weird. Everywhere I go, like we've got a I don't know, for example, we've got a, a little unit where we had storage, which we're not going to need for much longer. We're moving it all into the stores here. But like, when I walk in, if I ever have trousers on, which I do wear trousers, by the way, the, the ladies behind the desk will be like, why haven't you got your shorts on? <laughs> I'm like, that's weird. That you, that's how you view me as the person who wears shorts and flip-flops. And in the school playground, that's, a, that's what I was known as. I was known as the dude who always wears shorts and flip-flops, even if it's minus three. I dropped the kids off at school. I dropped Joel off at school. And because of the way Joel is, within about three months, I then became known as, that's Joel's dad. <laughs> he, he was a bit of a handful at school. And so he became, that's who I became. And now I've got four kids. That's how we're known. <laughs> it's that them people with four kids. So our identity does change over time, but... When I think about the Bible characters, I want you to think about this because we all do it. We all think of classic, famous Bible characters and we pigeonhole them in their identity. And I think so often we actually have a case of mistaken identity about that person. If you think about David, we think of boy, hero, king. It's like this boy, hero, king dude. That's who David was. And yet he was also an adulterer and a murderer. Well, that's changed the tone of the room. When you think of Joseph being... Uh, the dream, dream boy, I think he's called in some comics. Of, uh, uh, Joel's got a little um, comic Bible comic book thing, and he's called Dream Boy. And I like that. He's, he was Dream Boy Prime Minister. That's how we sort of the lens we view him through. That's his identity. But he was also a victim. He was also a slave. And in some people's eyes, he was a rapist. Now, he wasn't that, but that was his identity to a whole group of people for decades. You think of Moses, Moses, you think of a, of a leader, mouthpiece of God. And yet other people would view him as someone who couldn't speak, who was disobedient. <laughs> you think of Gideon. And he thought of himself as a, the weakest of the weak tribe. I'm the weakest of the weak and God called him a mighty warrior. These things don't seem to add up. You think of the Apostle Paul. Some viewed him, and he might have even viewed himself at some point as a murderous terrorist chasing and hunting down Christians. But other people saw him as a zealot religious man or a church builder. And you, the best one, I think, is poor old Thomas. The, the, the poor old disciple Thomas. What his identity is known for. All the things he'd done, he followed Jesus around for three years, doing everything all the other guys did. Like Judas even gets off scot free, free I think, compared to uh, to to Thomas, because we know Thomas as who? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. Poor bloke. That's his identity through the thousands of years. You can imagine him being out there. That's not fair. That's one line. One line in the play. One line in the movie. One line in the scripture. And that's what I get labelled. That's my identity. And I want you to think about that. 
that we, we've done that with Thomas in the Bible. We, we have a mistaken identity. We have a very narrow view of who Thomas was and his identity. And yet he surely was so much more than that. And yet we can do that with other people in our world and other people can do that about us and we can even do it about ourselves. And the last one I think of is Peter, as we know as the rock, not Dwayne Johnson. We've covered that a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Peter was the rock that Jesus built his church on. And yet also his identity, if we really think about it, is that he was the guy that got terrified when his feet got a little bit wet. All right, he was walking on water just before it. But he was that, he was that dude. And he was a denier of Jesus when Jesus wasn't around. He was two-faced around Paul when he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. And Paul said, oi, that's, you're being a bit of a hypocrite there. He was all of them things. And what's my point? <laughs> what you're known for is not you. What you're known for is not you. It's not the fullness of your identity. And when we or others view us in that way or we view others in that way, we, we fall into that trap of mistaken identity, which leads me to the question really is, what, what is identity then? What is identity? Is it, is it how we see ourselves? Or is it how we think others see us? Or is it how others actually see us? <laughs> Or is it what we declare we are to others? Or, or is it how we actually are? Or is it a mosaic of all of them pieces and perhaps even more on top of that? So I want to address a couple of them. I want to address how we see ourselves. Because I think this is where our culture's going. It's, we've been driven down this, this one-way street, it feels like. We're going with the current. That our identity is whatever we say we are. This is how we see ourselves and how we project onto the world. And I want to ask the question, really, and I think I know the answer, but I'll get shouted down if I say it, would be, can we simply choose and proclaim our identity? Can we do that? Can we simply choose and proclaim it and be like, I identify as, and I don't want your brain to go to the, the, the stuff that's happening in the media. At the I mean, I'm talking wide scope here. Can we simply just proclaim, this is who I am, this is... I identify as this particular thing. Because I thought about for me. Like for me, I think of myself, and you know, this sounds big-headed, but I think of myself as quite physically tough. I like MMA, I like jiu-jitsu, I like rugby. I'm quite a physically tough bloke. And I'm relatively, otherwise I couldn't do what I'm doing, verbally competent. And I say relatively. <laughs> I'm relatively verbally competent, and I'm a big, physically tough guy. And that's... That's me. That's, ha that's my identity. And yet someone else could view that as more like, actually, you look like a bully. They're good components of a bully, a bully, big and tough and strong and competent with their tongue. For me, I might think of myself and, and project and say, this is who I am and you must accept it. That I, I'm someone who has a stable mood because I generally do have all my life been quite stable in who I am and how I feel and what I do. I'm not led by feeling, and that's maybe what I want to give as my identity, but someone might look at me and measure me and, and think of my identity as someone who is emotionally unintelligent. There might be a bit of truth in that. But that's how someone else could view me. I, I think of myself, and <laughs> I get proven wrong lots of times, but I still think it. I'm like a funny joker sort of guy. I like to make light of things. I joke about everything. Joke, 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 joke. And, and for me, I'm like just this fun, jokery kind of guy. But someone else probably thinks you're annoying, irritating, immature, muppet. Shut up! <laughs> Shush. So, I will pose this, but what good is it if I, think, if I think I'm a friendly, funny, inclusive, intelligent guy, if literally everyone else on the planet thinks I'm a dismissive, rude, unfunny, annoying, dumb bloke? Because who is right? And that's rhetorical. <laughs> Before you answer that. Because <laughs> often, I, th I think we get confused, and, and this is why we're in crisis individually sometimes. We think the identity we believe ourselves to have is the same as the one others perceive. And my experience is that that's rarely the case. And, and I think you should know that. I think I should know that, embrace that, and not... 
be led by that, but at least know it. And so is your identity what you think or say or believe it is, or is your identity what others think or say or believe it is? Because <laughs> if, I want you to think about this, if, if the way we see ourselves is not reflective of the reality of everyone else's, what they see, perhaps we are mistaken about our identity. And maybe we should question the validity of the belief in our identity, perhaps. So instead then, should we allow our identity to be determined by how others see us? Should we allow what other people think of us to determine our identity? Because maybe we're mistaken about ours. Maybe everyone else sees you in a slightly different way than you see yourself. And that's probably very true. And I heard a famous psychologist once say that identity is a negotiation. I think I talked to Josh about this the other day. I think it was Josh. That identity is a negotiation. It isn't just what you think of you. And it's not just what others see in you. It's like this, it's like this battle between them two things over time happening. Until everything settles. Until in a, in a situation when people know each other. Everyone's got a fair idea of who you are, who I am, what you think of me, what I think of you. And it's more of this negotiation with us and the world around us. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it, there's some wisdom in that, understanding how other people view you. I think there's merit in that. Not being driven and led by that, but understanding it. And I think Jesus understood it as well and was inquisitive about it. We're getting to the scripture now. Matthew 16, 13 to 18 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, some people argue that he's talking generally about the term son of man. Other people are saying, who do people say I am regarding the son of man? And, and we won't stick on that for a little while. But verse 14 says, well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the, or one of the other prophet, prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you, and he's talking to his disciples, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And this must have been weird. It's like, we've been with you for ages, mate. You're JC. You're Jesus. You're the J-man. That's who you are. But he says, who do you say I am? And then Simon answered. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John. Because that's how it had been known. His name was Simon, and he was known by his family name, or, or his father's name, son of John. That's how we get many of our names, Williamson. It's shortened to William. So that's how people would have been known. It's that bloke who's that bloke's son or that lady who's that bloke's daughter. That's how people were known. That was his part of his identity. Jesus was saying, Simon, son of John, that's your worldly identity now. That's how it is at the moment. But he says this, because you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And now I love this, the way Jesus flips this. He says, now I say to thee, you, you are Peter. He said, you're Pete, you're not Simon, son of John. All right, that's a, that's a bit of your history. It's an important mosaic of, the, of your character, of your identity. But that's not who you are in my eyes. Who you are in my eyes is the rock. That's what Peter means, means rock. Simon means reed, this thing that fall, falls over easy. And Jesus said, I'm changing your name. I'm changing your identity to be that that is strong, which I'm going to build my church on, the rock. Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And this is so rich, I could spend months just talking about this this scripture, but there's, a, there's a, a lot of things going on here, but a couple of the things that are going on is that it seems that Jesus was interested in what those who were not close to him thought about other people, or thought about the Son of Man, thought about him, and, it, and those who, who were close to him. Who do you say? You've been around me a long time. Who do you say I am? And yet he understood that not necess what they saw and what they said was not necessarily correct. <laughs> so when I think about this maybe we should only take into account <laughs> what others think of us not be led by it not be driven by it not found our whole belief about who we are but maybe we should just take into account how other people see us with regard to our identity and, and the identity that we want to portray to help us effectively navigate in the world whether that's just generally socially or, or building his kingdom. But 
Them two things are maybe important, how we view ourselves, how we see ourselves, and how others see us. But something I think, I think you know where I'm going, that supersedes that is that the second thing that Jesus was addressing, which was how he viewed Peter. And so I want us to think about today is with our identity and what it is, it's, is it more about how God sees us? Is it more about how God sees us? Because Jesus said to Simon, you're, you know, you're Reed boy, that's who you are. But that, that's your name. I love that. He sort of separated. That, that's your name, but that's not your identity. You've been, you've been funneled down this way, but I want to I wanna change your identity because that's a mistaken identity. That's what the world has made you to be. Not, not out of malice or anything like that, but you just happen to be the son of John. <laughs> so that, and they called you Simon, but this is who you've grown up to, to be. But that's mistaken. That is not your identity. It's been put on you by those around you, and you've maybe adopted that. And I love the way that God sees us and our identity and who we are, the very core of us, very different to the world. And you look in the Old Testament when Samuel was picking the king of Israel. I'll read the scripture in 1 Samuel 6, 7. He says, the Lord said to Samuel, he's going through all the brothers. He says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. He's saying them characteristics that would usually stick out to mean you're the king Good looking, big bloke, who can fight, who people as a natural leader personality type. He said, ignore all that stuff. They're the markers that the world use. I'm not interested in that. That's not his identity. The little squeedy, tiny little cheese boy who's not even president, that's the person I'm interested in. And his identity is going to be king of Israel. It says, for the Lord sees not as man sees. I love that. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So often we, we base our identity and we, we look at other people's identities and they do with us just on outward appearances, characteristics that can be viewed or displayed. And God says, that's not how I measure things. I, I built you, I created, it says in Jeremiah this, I knew you before I formed you. I want you to think about that. I want you, this, because I don't think our brains can fully comprehend this. I knew you before I formed you. God's so much out of time and powerful. He understood exactly who you are before he even created you. He knew you. Before, it's, like, it's like understanding what a cake tastes like before you've even baked it. <laughs> I'm, I'm really pushing the bake-off theme. Buy your flourish tickets. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, check this, I set you apart. And he was talking about Jeremiah. And appointed you as prophet to the nations. I appoint you. He's saying that is the, one of the big parts of your identity of how I see you. And that's happened before you were even born. Not what culture has said about you. Not how you feel about yourself. That is part of who you are. And I want you to think about this concept of mistaken identity. Because God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. He knows your identity. He created it. Not this shallow veneer of an identity that we sometimes walk out in, but the deep you, the true you, the real you. <laughs> I believe God made us who we are, and he's assigned us an identity of, of who we are as an individual, if you like. But more importantly, perhaps, on top of that, or perhaps underneath that, is all the things that, if you're a believer in Christ, that God says and sees and says that you are. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says this, but you're not like that, for you're a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation. That's part of our identity as, as followers of Christ. And maybe you're not a Jesus follower. Maybe you're not a Christian in the room and you're, this whole church thing's new to you. But can I tell you, if you ever make the decision to follow Christ and accept him into your life, is that you become <laughs> a priest, a royal priest. And some of you, that might freak you out. <laughs> But you're a royal priest. That's part of who you are now. John 15, 15 says this. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Jesus said this. No, now you are my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. And so often we, we get our identity about with our friendship group. But Jesus says, no, part of your identity now is you're a mate of mine. You're a friend of Jesus. That's who you are. That's part of your makeup. Galatians 3, 26 to 28 says this, for you are all, check this, children of God. Some of us are known by our family name, our father, whoever, our big brother, whoever that is. But 
Paul writes to the Galatian church, for you are all children of God. Your daddy's the big daddy. You're all children of God. That's, who, that's part of your identity now through faith in, in Christ Jesus. And all have been united with Christ in baptism. Have put on Christ. Love that. Like putting on new clothes. Like taking off old clothes, discarding them, Paul says, and putting on new clothes. That's like taking that old worldly identity off and putting this new identity in Christ on. And I love this. Check this out. It says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, these two big categorizations of identity, they're no longer here. It says there's no longer slave or free, no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And it's not that those classifications don't exist. It's not like all of a sudden there weren't men and women, there weren't Gentiles. And there were, it's not that those classifications didn't exist in the world. But Paul was saying to the Galatian church, I don't want you to value them. I don't want you to lift them up and give them things weight to give you identity. They're just a small mosaic of a tile of part of who you are. I want that little tile to be pressed on and founded on the base and the foundation that is Christ. Galatians 2.20 says this, My old self has been crucified with Christ. Check it. It is no longer I who live. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer that old man-made identity. But Christ who lives in me. Colossians 3.3 says this, For you died to this life. And I love this. And your real life, your real life is hidden with Christ. In God. So if you're, if you're a Christian, if you've accepted Christ, effectively your, your old ID died all that time ago. And maybe you've kept the, the license, the driving license of that ID. And you, and you wear it and you proclaim it and you feel it and you give it weight. But Paul would write that that thing's gone. Cut up that old driving license. That old identity is not part of who you have to be. It's not part of how others have to see you. Not that we give that too much value, but you're now accepted in Christ. And you now need to accept that you, your, your identity is now solidly found in Christ and founded in Christ. <laughs> like I said, I... I think all these parts of the mosaic of our identity are just little tiles then that are just placed on the, on the sub-base that is Jesus. And I believe your identity, my identity, is who God says you are. It's not just who you proclaim to be. It's not just how other people see you, even though that might be a, a part of, of us getting through life. But our actual identity is is who God says we are. And Peter put it like this to followers of Christ in 1 Peter 2, 10. He said, once you had no identity as a people, you had all these different characteristics and in groups and pockets and created these man-made identities, but once you had no identity as a people, but now you are God's people. That is, Peter saying, that is your identity, is that you are God's people. That's, your identity. Yet, if for you or other people for you, if your identity is consumed by one or two external characteristics, just one or two of them mosaic pieces, then I think you may miss out on the full life that Jesus has for you and how he wants you to view yourself and how others may view you. And so I want to say, don't allow culture, other people, or even your own mind to box you in to an identity. Don't be funneled into becoming a classic case of mistaken identity. Push back against that. <laughs> so I ask, who are you? Who are you? For me, you're exactly who God designed you to be. That's who you are. Not labels culture put on you or you've put on you, your identity is found in Jesus. And that's no mistake. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just thank you.